Welcome back to our IB Biology video series. This is the fourth video in IB Biology Topic 2, Molecular Biology, where we will be looking at nucleic acids, DNA processes, including replication, transcription and translation, and gene transfer. As discussed in our IB Biology Topic 1 video series, the nucleus contains genetic information in the form of nucleic acids. These nucleic acids, in particular DNA, are designed efficiently to store genetic information, which codes for the production of proteins. Nucleic acids can either be deoxyribose nucleic acid, DNA, or ribose nucleic acid, RNA. These nucleic acids are the building blocks of life, and they themselves consist of building blocks known as nucleotides. A nucleotide contains three main components, a nitrogenous base, a sugar, and a phosphate. However, these parts are slightly different in DNA versus RNA, so let's take a look at them. In DNA, there are four different nitrogenous bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. The sugar component is made of deoxyribose, and the phosphate region is simply a phosphate group. In RNA, the nitrogenous bases are the same, except thymine is replaced with uracil. In addition, the sugar component is made of ribose. The phosphate region is identical. For nucleotides to form DNA, or RNA, they must join by condensation. During this, the 5' prime end of a nucleotide binds to the 3' prime end of the next nucleotide. This forms a strand with an outer chain of sugars and phosphates, known as the sugar-phosphate backbone. In DNA, this forms a helical, double-stranded structure, whereas in RNA, this forms a linear, single-stranded structure. The IB syllabus expects you to know the structure of DNA in detail, so we will explore that now. DNA is a double helix made of two anti-parallel strands of nucleotides linked by hydrogen bonding between complementary base pairs. But what does this all mean? Double helix relates to the twisted, two-stranded structure formed. Anti-parallel relates to the fact that one strand runs in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction, whilst the other runs in a 3' prime to 5' prime direction. Complementary base pairing describes the fact that the nitrogenous bases always bind in distinct pairs. Adenine will always bind to thymine, with two hydrogen bonds, and guanine will always bind to cytosine, with three hydrogen bonds. But who discovered this information? Franklin and Wilkins, and Watson and Crick. Franklin and Wilkins used X-ray diffraction to reveal the double helix structure of DNA. Watson and Crick then used this information to create cardboard and metal shapes to represent the components of DNA. Through trial and error, they uncovered complementary base pairing, since the joined strands must have a consistent width. From here, they theorised the strands must have been anti-parallel. Now that you understand the structure of DNA and RNA, let's look at a very common exam question. Contrast the structure of DNA and RNA. As always, these questions are best approached using whereas statements. So, in DNA, thymine is present, whereas in RNA it is not. In DNA, uracil is not present, whereas in RNA it is. DNA is a double helix, whereas RNA is a linear shape. DNA is double-stranded, whereas RNA is single-stranded. DNA contains a deoxyribose sugar, whereas RNA contains a ribose sugar. That's it. But how is this DNA duplicated, read, and used to make protein? Let's take a look at this now. Along with discovering the structure of DNA, Watson and Crick suggested that DNA must replicate in a process known as semi-conservative replication. They suggested that the two strands of DNA must separate, 
before each is used as a template to generate a new complementary strand. The term semi-conservative therefore arose as each new strand conserves half of the DNA from the original strand. But how was this process confirmed? Well, this was thanks to the work of Messelson and Stahl. They began by culturing E. coli in heavy radioactive nitrogen-15. They then centrifuged the DNA with cesium chloride to split the strands apart. They observed a single band representing DNA only containing nitrogen-15 at the bottom of the test tube. They then moved the E. coli to a lighter nitrogen-14 medium and repeated the same stages. Here, they observed a new band above the previous nitrogen-15 containing DNA, representing DNA containing both nitrogen-14 and nitrogen-15. After a further generation, they observed that the nitrogen-15 band disappeared, and a new band above the nitrogen-14-15 band was seen, representing DNA containing only nitrogen-14. Further generations showed a reduction in the size of the nitrogen-14-15 band with a growth in the nitrogen-14 band. This therefore proved that the DNA was replicating by semi-conservative replication. So, what occurs during DNA replication? Well, several key enzymes work to duplicate the DNA. First, DNA helicase unwinds and separates the DNA strands by breaking hydrogen bonds. DNA polymerase then links free nucleotides, known as nucleotide triphosphates, to the template strands using complementary base pairing. The two identical copies wind back to form double helices. However, a semi-conservative DNA replication was not the only theory proposed. Two alternative theories included conservative replication and dispersive replication. Conservative replication stated that both parent strands remained together, and a complete duplicate was produced. Dispersive replication stated that every DNA strand produced had a mixture of old and new sections. So, you now know the structure and replication of DNA. But how is it actually used? Well, this is the role of transcription. Transcription is the synthesis of mRNA from DNA. During this process, RNA polymerase unwinds the double helix and separates the strands. RNA polymerase then binds free nucleotide triphosphates to one of the pre-existing strands via complementary base pairing. However, given that RNA is generated, uracil is used instead of thymine when forming the complementary base pair to adenine. Once complete, the mRNA strand then separates from the DNA, and the DNA reforms its double helix. Simple. So where is the production of protein? Well, Q translation. Translation is the synthesis of protein from the mRNA strand at the ribosome. Whilst discussing this process, the term codon is often used. This is simply a sequence of three nucleotides that act as a stop for enzymes regarding genetic information, i.e. enzymes read each codon before moving on to the next. The process of translation can be given by the following steps. First, the mRNA strand binds at the ribosome. A transfer RNA, tRNA, molecule then binds to the mRNA strand. The tRNA binds via hydrogen bonds using its anticodon which is complementary to a specific codon on the mRNA strand. The tRNA is also associated with an individual amino acid, and so this is bound too. Once bound, a second tRNA binds to the next codon. The ribosome then forms a peptide bond between the two adjacent amino acids on the first and second tRNA. The first tRNA then detaches and the ribosome moves along the mRNA to the next codon, so that another tRNA can bind. This process is repeated, creating a string of amino acids, known as a polypeptide, i.e. a protein. 
Eventually, translation stops, and the string of amino acids is free to detach. If you are studying IB Biology higher level, you will explore the processes in greater depth in Topic 7. The genetic code created by the processes of transcription and translation is universal across all living organisms, which allows for cross-species biological replication of DNA. However, the IB focuses in greater depth on chemical replication of DNA through the polymerase chain reaction, PCR. This is used when minute quantities of DNA must be replicated, for example, at crime scenes. During this process, DNA is mixed with primers and heated to 95 degrees Celsius for 15 seconds. The DNA is then cooled to 54 degrees Celsius to allow the primers to bind. Next, TAC DNA polymerase is added at 72 degrees Celsius, which adds complementary nucleotides. These stages above can then be repeated for hours to generate millions of copies of DNA, which can then be used in forensic or paternity investigations. The TAC DNA polymerase is used as it is resistant to denaturation and capable of adding nucleotides incredibly quickly, at 1,000 bases per minute. It is extracted from a deep sea vent organism called Thermus aquaticus. And that's it. You now know the complete process by which DNA is constructed, replicated, transcribed, and translated. We hope you enjoyed the fourth video in our IB Biology Topic 2 video series. Check out our notes, flashcards, and questions on our website to reinforce your understanding from this video.